Well, thank you to today's speakers um, and uh, all the speakers. Uh, you know, we've had a great number of talks. Um, so just in terms of the panel session, uh, just the structure of it, um, I'll, uh, I'll start just by summarizing just my own sort of notes on, on the talks today, uh, which I've organized a little bit. And then I'll start off, uh, start us off with uh, sort of a big picture question that, uh, that, um, that each of the panelists can answer. We'll kind of go around. And um, then we have some additional questions that, that we've put together uh, but we'll sort of open the floor to uh, alternating, uh, perhaps to uh, uh, to folks uh, online to either use a chat, which has work been working pretty well, or um, or just uh, unmute or raise your hand. Okay, so um, I've grouped it into to these uh, four categories. Just uh, again, uh, a little bit of a uh, a space issue here. So machine learning for autonomy, formal methods and verification. In this case, uh, human machine and applications. So um, just starting at the top, so we kicked off today with, um, uh, you know, Peter talking about um, reinforcement learning with constraints and how to uh, sort of basically uh, integrate uh, uh, what you may have in an autonomy type problem and how do you uh, incorporate Lagrange multipliers um, into that framework and sort of avoid sort of an oscillating type condition that, uh, that happens frequently. And the, the idea is basically to use a, a type of dynamic feedback. They also talked about the use of this in, um, so th this was, uh, so th uh, he also talked about cue learning in the presence of noise. And sort of the solution here was um, to sort of uh, take, uh, create uh, uh, ensembles of, of, uh, of, uh, of these functions by choosing different initial conditions and using sort of UCB for exploring and deciding, you know, which, which functions to, to move forward and how, how to move. So I think the, the cool things about these two, two to the, these two topics were, there were kind of things that you do, practical things you do and counter autonomy problems, noise and, and the requirement of constraints. And they were like very principle based. So one could sort of understand from a mathematics point of view, what was going on and, and, and cast it that way. Um, so we heard also about uh, sort of reachability and sensitivity problems um, from Cheyenne and how to use learning there um, to advantage. Um, then uh, both from uh, George and Katie, we heard about um, sort of adversarial training. So with uh, Katie talked about ad adaptive stress testing. So using learning to find worst case things rather than um, sort of uh, uh, best case things. And um, George also uh, talked about this in a sort of robust, uh, a deep learning setting. Then um, I put it here in the machine learning uh, side here, but George sort of um, emphasized the importance of sort of uh, control architectures, and um, and the fact that you know uh, you know many of the control architectures that people use don't may not be the perfect one in this sort of uh, uh, sort of learning world if we're going to try to, to try to deal with robustness and uncertainty type problems. Talked about how do we model environment? I think this is a great thing. We'll come back to this uh, for uh, for the uh, for the panel, and and uh, you know, technical on the technical side, George explicitly talked about uh, semantic slam. So the other other area was sort of uh, formal methods and verification, and um, so we talked. Uh, Cheyenne talked about uh, uh, the fact that the electronics industry has this incredible tool chain. Uh, for doing uh, for doing design and verification and so on, you know, I mean, you know, the sound bite is is you to design a circuit, you just write a ver you know a Verilog file, right, and send it somewhere. So we don't have anything like that, um, you know, in sort of uh, in the autonomy world yet. Um, and uh, you know, tools that you know you work at the, all the different layers. And so, um, so th that was like a big idea. And then you talked about sort of his cord uh, language, cohort language um, as a way to sort of do abstraction and, and programming it to this, uh, to, to help um, implement uh, algorithms. But also it's a language that allows you to uh, connect with verific uh, uh, formal verification tools immediately. And so that's kind of a new idea um, and, or not a new idea, but uh, an important idea and uh, connects with sort of languages for this purpose and so on. Um, also uh, talked about uh, uh, model checkers for uh, sort of uh, logic, uh, sort of hybrid systems, uh, logic uh, plus physics type systems and when you can kind of decouple those. Um, uh, then 
George talked about verification of deep neural nets using uh, robust control, which uh, um, obviously I liked. And, um, and uh, how to use sort of IQCs and SDPs to, to, to sort of do that and sort of to get sort of guarantees sort of in the right direction. And also, um, you know, talked about in this, you know, maybe the need for using, uh, in a different context, the need for using maybe probabilistic specifications that maybe sort of hard, non-deterministic type specifications might be too much in certain cases. So then um, we talked uh, about the super important area of uh, human machine uh, dynamics, modeling, and interactions. Um, uh, Anka talked about sort of intended reward functions. And the idea, I think the, the, the big idea here, as I interpreted it, was you're, you're trying to uh, you know, model a human, a human's intentions. And sort of no matter what uh, reward function you come up with, it won't actually be you know, a, an accurate model of that human. Um, in every every context, and so so some of the subtleties and complexities of that, and then um, we we uh, we saw a little bit um, also from Katie and Cheyenne on um, on sort of applications of that for sort of trying to infer a, a pedestrian intent and um, you know take over from a, a fainting pilot. I guess that's kind of binary. Um, okay, uh, we saw a number of applications. Of course, uh, the last talk. Um, uh, um, stole the show in terms of applications, um, but we had uh, uh, so which was drones. But we had some very interesting things on sort of field robots and cars, and um, also sort of uh, I think in in, in uh, Katie's talk and also in in Keenan's talk now sort of a discussion of you know what are the failure modes um, and and the, the things we're looking for. So um, I've got some questions written here, uh, but the first question I'd like to put to the panel, I don't have written here. It's kind of like a very big picture question. I think it's just uh, um, an opportunity to get opinions. And um, it's, it's kind of like what, the, the question is, what are the biggest technical barriers from your perspective to sort of safe, deployable autonomy? And I think, um, I like the way Peter put it uh, earlier today was, you know, how do we get that, that final 1% or get you know the, the the very difficult one percent. What are the from your perspective? What are you know some of the interesting or most important barriers uh, from from uh, from your perspective? And um, I'm going to let Keenan ask Keenan to go first. Afraid of that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I saw you uh, unmuted. So <laughs> no, I think I, I think it's this, there are a lot of barriers. I think one of the sort of I'll talk about the, I think it's actually one of the bigger barriers and also one of the easiest barriers is just not designing for the operator, right? Like the, 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 the too many people from at least my world of, of robotics mindset and autonomy mindset, like have this notion that like autonomy is just autonomy and it just works and there's no operator. And that usually doesn't work in the real world. I don't know actually of any examples where you can't point at an operator of an autonomous system. Um, and, uh, and, and, and quite conversely, if you do really focus on your operator uh, and, and leverage them uh, in smart ways and empower them in smart ways, it actually makes it, you, you, can, you can make some of the harder technical problems far more tractable and get out in the real world so, sooner. And of course, getting out into the real world sooner is what flushes out the unknowns, the long tail of stuff you actually need to be worried about and, and fixing uh, as you improve the autonomy pieces of your system to was well, as we see it at Zipline, ever uh, consistently be increasing the capabilities of your operators with as your autonomy becomes more and more powerful uh, and more and more capable. Okay, thanks, George. Anyway, Why don't you go ahead? Answer, but for this audience, okay. yeah, uh, one that we live by at Zipline for sure. I mean, I'll break it. The answer in three parts. The first one, as I mentioned, is a little bit about architecture. Uh, I think. Uh, you know, finding the right pieces and how they should coexist and what are the right interfaces and, um, and what are the interfaces that lead to robust interconnections among the pieces is going to be something that will be with us for a while. So, for example, you know, we just heard that, you know, don't trust communications, trust sensors. That influences architecture. That makes the autonomous system, drives the architecture one way or another. I think those kind of architectural questions are going to be with us for a while, you know, especially when we look at different applications as well. Uh, the second part is, I think, 
uh, we need to, as I said, I guess in my talk, is in each of these components, we need to understand the interdependencies, but also think about how to make each component more robust, whether that's learning or whether that's control or whatever. And the third, which I think is the hardest one, uh, is how do we characterize in web environments can we guarantee what kind of safety? How do we have a metric for it? And what are some environments we can say, you know, under, you know, we don't, we can't really operate this in these environments, whether that's the weather environment that we heard, or whether it is the density of the inter intersection environment, uh, and or or speed uh, things. I think that that element is going to be the most challenging one because that's the one that introduces all the uncertainty and new corner cases that we may have not thought in design. So I'll stop there and then see what else. Uh, Anka? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, mainly one part that concerns me a bunch is just um, robustness to Covariage to the distribution shift, and mm -hmm. um, that happens. It seems like all the more with humans because they tend to be a source of distribution shift. <laughs> so how you can train these things to function well around people, as um, as all you have might be some data of some human human interactions before the robot went in. That that part is really tricky, and then. You know, I might be biased when I say this because of the style of work that we've been pursuing in my lab recently, but I really think that a major challenge to safety is defining what safety is. I think we've had some standard definitions so far, but the moment like I think about um, much more much more sophisticated setups, then it's not just collision avoidance anymore. It's not just, you know, some states that you don't want to be in. It becomes this, you know, what I try to do in my talk is present this notion of, well, doing the wrong thing with respect to the thing that the person really wants you to do. <laughs> like that's a, that would be a, a failure, um, arguably of safety, depending on how catastrophically wrong the thing that you're doing is. But when you don't have, you know, a nice hard constraint that someone specified, and that you trust, you know, it's with a threshold and you trust that threshold and that's the right number. When there's no ground truth for that and you accept that you're in an application where you, even if you put in a chance constraint, you have to say the probability of collision is blank. <laughs> But then even more broadly than that, it's not just safety, it's not just don't collide with things. That that just blows my mind, right? So I think that in a sense, that's that's to me maybe the biggest one. Uh, the other ones, at least we have nice definitions for, and we can work on that. And it's like, yes, you know, this robustness, that this is hard, robustness, that is, yeah, okay, good. Like we've been making progress on at least detecting that we're out of distribution and being conservative in that case and so on and so forth, cool. but. But not knowing what safety is to begin with me makes it really hard to enforce it. Okay, okay thank you. Um, Katie. So I, I think I would just echo what uh, everyone else is already saying. <laughs> I think it's harder as you get farther along the list. Um, yeah. So uh, everything they said, I think um, one thing um, that is um, very interesting along the lines of this sort of like testing and validation stuff. So again, this is sort of assuming you do have some idea of what um, your safety metric is or some standard, but I think the idea of being able to like generate interesting test cases is super interesting um, and a huge challenge as you get to more complicated situations. Um, so I really liked in Keenan's talk where they have all these different ways to basically just like sort of uh, attack their, their, um, their zips. Um, and it'd be nice if we could kind of uh, come up with these sorts of like uh, physical tests for all kinds of things. But I think that's um, as you get uh, more agents involved and sort of figuring out um, or have more complex situations, it becomes harder to sort of have these sort of unit tests, um, so to speak. And I think um, that's a, a part that I think even most uh, validation and verification tools and even mine, it sort of says given some scenario or given some setup, do that. But I think get, coming up with that like initial condition is, is still a challenge. Okay, Peter, and, uh, and you also have the uh, industrial uh, perspective as well. So that would be great. 
Yeah, so there are maybe three things I want to touch upon. Uh, definitely some overlap with what's already said. From the industrial perspective, I think the big difference when building an industrial system is that you get to focus on end-to-end -end performance. And maybe we can do that in academia too, but it's, it's not as not always as incentivized mm -hmm. to try to get to really good end-to-end -end performance. It's often more emphasized to you know invent new components. But I think ultimately that's where in some sense the magic happens is have a really good process to, you know, if something doesn't work, identify what part of the system is not working, or maybe it's not a part of the system, maybe it's assumptions about how you built the system, but having a really good process. And maybe that can be made academic and it would be quite interesting if, if we can do that. Um, second one, which is partially academic, partially industrial, I think doing unsupervised learning at yet much larger scale than we've seen so far, I think would go very far for robotic applications. Uh, we've seen it in language in the past 12 months that mm -hmm. just very large scale unsupervised learning opens up a lot of capabilities. There's no reason that shouldn't also be true in robotics. Um, of course, language models are large, but you know, video models are even larger. And if you want to train video prediction models on the same you know, amount of conceptual, same amount of data, I don't know if we can do that today, but it, it seems a big opportunity if we can make it happen. And then the third one I want to touch upon, and many of people have touched upon this, is interactivity with the human operator or engineer. I think it's um, it's very often the case that you know things just get coded, and then there is some components that do whatever they're supposed to do, maybe. But actually, uh, together it doesn't work, and it just doesn't feel like there is a, a proper feedback cycle to you know steer a system to behave differently. That's hey, it. cool. Thanks, uh, Cheyenne. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, this is a big topic and uh, I'll just um, emphasize some of the things that have already been mentioned, maybe add some more details. So uh, to begin with, I think architecture is super important. George already mentioned, and he talks about uh, interfaces. And I mean, in my talk, I was talking about abstractions, pretty much the same thing, but basically what you want is some way of modularizing this entire pipeline and having some notion of what you can expect from uh, each of these modules, right? So, and there are two parts to this expectation. We have talked a lot about guarantees, but it's also a more mundane piece, which is uh, representation. Like, okay, we are getting something from the perception side. How is it represented? Uh, what kind of data structures? And then comes what kind of guarantees can you make on top of that? So I think once we get to uh, define these interfaces, at least the different disciplines can make progress on their piece or their, their module. So I think that's, that's an important, um, um, thing that we don't quite have yet. Um, and once you have this modularization, you can build benchmarks and tools and people can make progress. Um, the other thing that I'm very interested in, and um, a lot of the talks um, touched upon this today, uh, is this um, in interface between uh, machine learning and the rest of the design automation pipeline. I mean, obviously machine learning is going to play an enormous role. It's already doing so in, in various parts. How does that work with the rest of the uh, design automation pipeline? Um, and finally, this um, question of defining safety came up. I'll just say a couple of things. Um, you know, ultimately, I think uh, the different kinds of autonomous systems are going to have slightly different types of evolution. Uh, the FAA, for example, has a very strong safety culture. They have been doing it for many, many years right now. So if you want to fly something, as Timan was saying, you have to pass certain tests, right? You cannot just write up your autonomous systems and fly. Um, and uh, it's not going to be the same for self-driving cars. And in manufacturing, it might be something different. Uh, in the self-driving car scenario, the way things are going, they're defining these ODDs, right? So the uh, operating uh, design domains, uh, that sort of encapsulates your safety. Uh, Cheyenne, safety uh, we lost about the last 30 seconds. Sorry. Actually, uh, I think it might have been only your problem. Yeah, oh, it was me. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, I lost, yeah. uh, I lost uh, the last 30 seconds. Yeah. So I was just talking about these ODDs that are trying to define the safety cases for autonomous vehicles. And that, that doesn't cover everything. Obviously, it's in the very early stages. Um, and that would be probably um, the path towards defining 
uh, safety scenarios. Okay, cool. So, are there are there uh, questions um, uh, that uh, folks uh, listening want to watching want to ask? I see one either either uh, uh, unmute and ask or put it through the um, through the chat. I see one which is from David McPherson. Um, I guess uh, this uh, relates to Keenan's uh, answer, which is uh, how do you incorporate an operator without relying on communication in the loop? You know, we, we basically we just take a really expansive view of who users are and, and sort of that taking that you know, user centered design mindset that's become an, that's thankfully become the norm in design today. So uh, this is everybody. So we think about everybody from the people who have to approve our routes in the regulator to uh, well, in Rwanda and Ghana today, the air, our airspace is overseen like our flight traffic is overseen by air traffic controllers. And we build UIs and things for them. And so, you know, I, I may have overstated my saying we don't rely on comms at all, but we intentionally design their ability to basically deconflict our aircraft with passenger aircraft uh, around the layered communication systems we have. So our last layer of, of, of communication is a satellite radio that if we can sneak it just even a few bytes through, uh, that we can get a command to our vehicle to tell it to turn around or even land by parachute for a deconfliction reason. And then all the protocols for those air traffic controllers are designed around basically the, have to basically manage the airspace with enough margin that they can that they can uh, that, that we have time essentially for for the 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 the, the, the quick communication stuff not to be working. Um, and that's and that's sort of how we think about you know. That's sort of what I mean by thinking about your operators. Just think about everybody involved in that process and how you know how to really make it work for them in really scalable ways where they can add value to safety, right? Like the when we first were doing regulatory route approvals, the regulator was not adding value. It was just a crazy complex formality. Uh, but once we really engaged with them and, and sort of had an open conversation about it, now they do add value. Now they are they do help us see things and find things and find opportunities to optimize for safety and just simply how you know where, where our baseline routes go. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a really kind of pedantic or like non not a very glamorous piece of what we do, but uh, improving that made a big difference to our ability to scale. Um, okay, great, Keenan. I don't know if you, can you see the uh, chat or shall I read I it? Can. What do you do if a, more than one zip is running out of battery at the same time? It's a good question. We can land every forty five seconds, so they have to be like really the same time, and the behaviors are layered all the way to the point where if a zip basically can't get the priority queue to land, it will go to a nearby uh, literal green field we have designated and pull its parachute over that field before it runs out of battery. Um, so, yeah. Additional questions right now, otherwise I'll go to one off the slide. Okay, so the, one, the first one I have listed here is, you know, how can we be more uh, confident in answers from machine learning? So I'm talking about, um, Sort of guarantees, or you know, it's a little bit better understanding for uh, 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 the idea of a guarantee. And then you know, it came up uh, George and a couple other people mentioned it. You know, how do we demonstrate confidence? You know, these are kind of connected things. So um, you know, Peter also talked about that today. Uh, the idea of we you know we might not be able to get an analytical answer, but we can still you know from you know being uh, using pr you know principle-based methods and using things in smart ways, we can still get notions of confidence. So I think I think this is for all panelists in parallel. You know, you know, this seems to be a pretty big uh, pole in the tent based on our first question. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, what, what are the ideas for how, how we can how we can get that confidence and, and how we would demonstrate it, you know, rather than just necessarily going out in the field and exploding a rocket or, you know, uh, crashing a, a, a drone. We're all pulling for SpaceX today. Yeah, so. Somebody wanna start us? I can start. I'd, I'll push back on your, I guess I'm the challenger of questions today. I'll push, up on, I'll push up on your question back and say that maybe we want them to be less confident in answers. Um, meaning that I think first and foremost, the challenge is to have this kind of calibrated uncertainty and to have the thing actually recognize that it doesn't know something. Um, and I think that's the, the biggest, like the, maintaining proper uncertainty is I think where the key actually is. So I think a lot of the brittleness we get in 
learning systems today is because there's one solution out of many solutions, many, many function approximators fit the data. You pick one based on, you know, the laziness of SGD, whichever it encountered, right? Based on initialization, based on many things, uh, based on your regularization, you end up with one. And I think the challenge is that you don't recognize that are these many possible solutions that are consistent with the data that you've seen. If you did realize that, if the learner realized that, then we'd, then we'd be in a much better place because then we can, we can, for instance, go the active learning route and probe the person back at areas yeah. of high uncertainty and say, well, I don't actually know what I would do here. And this goes to, to, to Katie's point too of coming up with these you know, test cases. I think to me, the most exciting is when you use learning to come up with those test cases where you really say, okay, here's a hypothetical. Let me dream up a thing that could happen where I wouldn't know what to do. And then can you give me feedback on my default behavior there or tell me what to do or whatever? I feel like that would be, that's my dream world, right? So I don't want them to be more confident. I want them to be sort of appropriately confident. I think a challenge that we have now is that they're overconfident a lot of the time. So um, so the way I interpret that, I guess, is um, let me just kind of reword it uh, in, in how I take it, is Please. the way we can be confident is by keeping track carefully of uncertainty and um, and then uh, quantifying our level of confidence with that uncertainty. You know, because the the yeah. you know one of the dangers is if we have no idea, we don't know, uh, and where where that uncertainty is. Uh, that's how sort of how I'm understanding part of your answer. Is, is there anyone else who wants to weigh in? Uh, go ahead, I Peter. Just just Sanka jump in. Completely. Oh, sorry. No. Yeah. Uh, I want to double click on what Anka said in terms of knowing when you don't know seems really critical for any deployed system. Um, and I think that'll also likely differentiate the systems we see deployed in the near term versus further future um, based on whether you need a real time intervention from a human supervisor because real time intervention is really hard to do. Like human supervision is not too hard to get, but real time intervention where you need to really be present in the moment to do that intervention, it's pretty much as costly as just being there. And so those applications, I think, have a, yeah, they're gonna be pretty far in the future. Um, but applications where no real-time intervention is needed, just a backup that can easily take a few seconds before somebody reacts. I think there, if you know when you don't know, all of a sudden you, you are kind of set and you can start operating. And I think that's really exciting. Um, of course, you don't wanna call on humans every two seconds, but yeah. Let me contradict you. Can I? Yes. So sure. I'm curious. We have to fight. So, so I think that if you have the <laughs> uncertainty, you don't have, you, you're not stuck with just at runtime, figure now you're in a new place where you don't know. So call the, the operator. You could actually leverage that uncertainty at training time better. If you can be in an active learning setting, right? Like you can dream up situations and sort of resolve your ambiguity before deployment time. And I think that's part of the coolness of this is that it's not just delaying the problem to deployment time, it's kind of filling in your gaps as part of the training process by yes, acquiring more data and going to the human, but going to the human as, at, at training time where humans are available as opposed to in deployment. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I still think that it'll hit its limits because once you go to the real world, there will be out of distribution things that you just couldn't train for it, but it might get you a lot further than without doing it. Go ahead, George. No, I don't think I have anything to add. I agree with uh, what has been said uh, completely. I think the auto distribution, I think the, uh, uh, you know, the, I mean, to some extent, uh, we have an architecture that every component is introducing and removing some uncertainty. And we just hope that this thing stabilizes over time. Uh, I do think that one uh, issue that I foresee a little bit, which especially for those on the more on the formal method side or, you know, uh, uh, including some of our own work and goes back to what Anka said about how do we think about safety is that a lot of the frameworks, especially the offline frameworks are of the form, uh, you know, given a system, maybe with some uncertainty, and given some assumptions on the environment, I can prove something. And maybe this is about a module. 
I think uh, when you are, uh, as Peter said, in the real world and you have auto distribution changes or something, you know, the things change. And I think the question then becomes, what is the meaning of that offline guarantee that you had in that context? And how do you adapt it in an online setting? I think that's something that we all have to think a little bit about. It's like you're learning the assumptions of the fly of you know what your whatever design methodology whether you're on the control side the learning side or whatever of whatever you have proven or uh, empirically analyzed and i think that um, you know is going to be an issue and i think online methods and online safety guarantees will have a lot more to say again i agree with peter offline may take us a little bit further out and then maybe the online has to do a smaller piece, but I think even the meaning of safety in that context may be a little bit different. Anyone else? I'll just mention some some of the stuff we've been working on, and some of the stuff we've seen some other uh, some other partners of ours work on, where they're basically these kind of. I hate to put the right label on it, but they're basically like either very efficient supervised methods or just unsupervised methods that are just basically crawling and you know, putting together data sets that are hundreds of millions of images large on the perception side and that are basically indiscriminately getting that information from the internet uh, to train these perception models. We're seeing some really exciting stuff in terms of how general they are because they're not and where the focus is on like weird axes of anti-bias, right? Like making sure that you're picking up images from IP coordinates that represent like all the countries in the world and that represent like a diversity of rural and suburban and represent a diversity of you know times of day and and things like that. Um, and it represent a diversity of capture as well. Uh, and I, I mentioned that last piece because I think this is just so important from trying to make this stuff work in the real world or like outside <laughs> is just, you know, if, if a lot of this stuff is structured or you know coming off of single imagers or any clean data, this kind of thing, then as soon as your sensor gets a little bit knocked or wonky or gets a drop of water inside the lens stack, all of a sudden the things start to break. Uh, but if you're if, if you're building these these data sets and training off these data sets are just massive, and where nothing nothing's being paid attention to at that level, there's this huge diversity of, you know, uh, of, of basically data sources. Um, seeing some really impressive results from these basically self-supervised stacks. Um, I, I, on that note, I do think that we need more data sets for a lot of the learning that we, you know, we use in autonomy. I think that is something that certainly in our work is, you know, we cannot just use ImageNet or whatever. Yeah, I think that's something, I mean, let alone the biases that you mentioned, but that I think is a challenge that the community should think about. Yeah, and budgets. <laughs> Training on those data sets is very expensive. <laughs> They're so big. Okay, there's a question uh, on the chat. Um, it's from uh, Kayleen Stocking. Um, it, it reads, uh, is there a model for the kinds of uncertainty that you can recognize at runtime, but not beforehand intuitively, if it's impossible to predict or you might have uncertainty, it seems like this might prevent you from recognizing uncertainty when you encounter it. Uh, does somebody wanna? Try to take that one. I think I can take a stab at it. So I think what's challenging the the hole that Peter found in my argument of just you know do everything at at training time, is that while while we might strive for methods that given an input, they can tell you. I'm uncertain, right? This is, I think the answer is this whole probability distribution plus I actually don't know what's going on. Um, I think we can strive for achieving that. And there's some methods that take a stab at that even with deep neural networks, but um, it, anyway, your mileage might vary. But assuming that we have that, what's hard is that you can query this on different possible inputs, but you still have to decide which inputs to query it on. So Peter's thought was that, well, you know, you train it, you train it with this uncertainty, and then at runtime, it sees different inputs come to it, right? And it can just say whether it's uncertain or not. But I was saying, well, let's actually leverage this at training time to sort of ask for more data, right? So you would mine for inputs that, that result in high uncertainty according to your model so far, 
you would get labels for those inputs, then you would retrain and hopefully you wouldn't have uncertainty in those particular places. And then you keep doing this, right, for a while until you sort of disambiguated everything. And I think what Peter pushed back on is to say, there's no way you can really exhaust everything. You might exhaust, you know, most places that you have a ton of uncertainty over, um, but you won't exhaust everything. I also think that this requires oftentimes this notion of data synthesis, which I also brushed under the rug. So you want to, in, in essence, you can't enumerate all possible inputs and then choose the one that you have highest uncertainty over, right? You have to synthesize inputs that you have uncertainty over. And that's an optimization you want to run, but it's in a non-convex optimization. Um, and, and it, it's also one that you wanna run over realistic possible inputs. Otherwise you're like in crazy adversarial example domains, which are really cool also to probe at brittleness, but you wanna, you know, you wanna say what, what's the kind of data that I might actually see in the world. And drawing that distinction now makes it really clear, what well, makes it really um, unclear because basically you can, you will have committed to some notion of what's a natural, naturally occurring input. And if your notion is wrong, then you know then you encounter out of distribution input even according to that notion in the real world so that's the that those are the challenges in there so it's not so much about kinds of uncertainty that you can recognize i think it's just a, really about that that where does the where do the inputs that you're testing in the song come from thanks uh, anyone else was, oh i think that was a great answer um there's also been a growing attention in like anomaly detection um, and that's basically assuming that you have these these events that might not occur in your your training data set or these really low probability events, and you want to be able to detect and recognize um, those sorts of um, events. And I think in general, those are sorts of um, events that you might not see beforehand, but do occur at runtime. Okay. Um, other questions? Anybody want to put them through the chat? or just speak up. Yeah, so I, I have a point of general discussion and I might be oh, taking great. it in a direction that, uh, you know, it's not listed here, but anyway, I'll, I'll bring it up. So this question of budget and data came up. So, and, and there are a lot of, uh, you know, junior people, uh, students in this audience here looking to define their research program. So a natural question that comes up in this type of discussion is, how to define um, or set a boundary on what type of research makes sense to do in the academic setting, given that the budget uh, for doing research in the industry might be 100x more. Uh, so for folks who are actually working very actively in the machine learning domain, I'd like to hear their take on how they look at this type of uh, problem formulation. So um, maybe to take Cheyenne's question and uh, direct it at um, uh, Peter, um, sorry to put you on the spot, Peter, but you know, when you're looking at projects and you're deciding, okay, um, are these things I should ask PhD students in my group to look at? Um, how do I differentiate between what I should do in a, like the company setting versus the academic setting? Uh, are the are these considerations that you take into account about the the sort of different resources, the data, the budget available? Yeah, I mean, on the data side, mining real world data is just hard to do in an academic setting. Now, it has happened. I mean, a good example is I think it was Fisher Yu who was a postdoc with Trevor Darrell who collected the Berkeley Deep Drive 100 something data set, and that's actually used quite widely as, as a large data set for driving research. Of course, you want more data in applications, but still for testing a lot of things, that data set was a pretty big deal. So it can be done, but it, it's non-trivial. Um, I think the possibly the, the trickier one is, is the compute though, because the compute is something where more compute things work better, it seems, because you can train a larger network for longer. And so, and you can run different kind of experiments. I'd say the, maybe the most recent example you know, was DeepMind's AlphaFold version two. And I think just to fold one protein is like multi GPU for multiple days to do, you know, find one solution, but that's just inference. 
um, let, let alone training something like that, right? So, it, and it wasn't even that expensive. So, oh, it was just, you know, a couple hundred GPUs for a, for a, few, for a few weeks. But in academic context, I think most research labs like from a single PI don't have access to a few hundred GPUs for, the, for that PI's lab. Some do, but most of them don't. And that is like for one project in your lab have access to a few hundred GPUs. That's, that's a whole different thing, right? If you have a lab with 10 students, that would mean a few thousand GPUs so they can all do their own projects. So I think it's, it's definitely a bit tricky. And yeah, it's not really clear what the answer is, is going to be short of maybe just needing to be really smart about thinking through smaller versions of problems where you can still gain the relevant insights and then you know write the paper that either shows those insights and somebody in industry can scale it up or then go to industry and say hey we got these insights but we'd like to write more of a home run paper what do you think about partnering uh and we can use your compute and our ideas but probably some new ideas will get added to it to to write the home run paper with the academics involved so yeah i think it's it's a bit complicated Are there some of these that you would say are definitely, you know, totally better suited to academia? I mean, well, I mean, the, I think there's a couple of subtleties here. One of them is that, um, well, I guess there's one that, that clearly based on the news last week and this week is clearly better suited for academia, which is uh, ethics, um, <laughs> which becomes very tricky within a company if you start calling out non possibly non-ethical things that your company is doing as part of their AI efforts. So. Clearly, I mean, academia is perfectly <laughs> positioned with freedom of speech and so forth to, you know, to really investigate those things. No, no doubt, uh, no conflicts of interest there, or at least not, not the same extent conflict of interest involved. Um, for people who haven't followed, this is a thing that happened at Google last week, and you, you can go look it up. Um, but yeah, a researcher's paper was apparently banned from being published because it called out some issues with the Google system. Um, so, um, and the researcher was then fired in the process to, you know, take it to a whole other level. So very complicated. Um, so yeah, I think these things, I'm not saying they shouldn't be feasible in industry, but clearly today they are more feasible in academia. Um, I think it's, it's not too hard. Well, actually the other thing I was gonna say, other than that, the distinction is actually hard to make sometimes because a lot of our PhD students just go to, whatever, Google, Facebook, and so forth. And they, they think of it as I'm continuing my PhD, but I'm getting paid more. It's like, I'm doing the same. If you ask them, what are you doing? Is it funny? They're like, yeah, it's like being a PhD student, but you get paid like 10 times more. Uh, I, I love it. It's, it's, you know, perfect life. Um, so in that sense, it's hard to draw the lines, I think, between what can be done in academia versus industry. Um, I do think academic labs have a bit more drive on average, even though that doesn't have to be the case. You get new students coming in. They wanna be different from previous students. They wanna build their own identity. And I feel like that gives a bit more innovation than you naturally get in industry labs. Okay. A while back, I used to say that there's a big distinction just in terms of the type of work that you can do, not just Peter's example of going against, you know, doing work that Peter's example is doing work that might somehow harm the main line of work that the company is doing and making money off of. But for the most part, not too long ago, it was not very easy to do industry research that wasn't contributing to the line of work that was the company was making money off of, right? And there were some exceptions, but even with those exceptions, your research is still supposed to contribute to the bottom line eventually foreseeably in the future. So that was excluding a lot of work that wasn't gonna contribute to the bottom line and it was on something else. Um, I think that's becoming a little bit less so right now, just because I think there is a lot of flexibility. Um, and also just because the kind of work that we all do now is starting to be such that it can contribute to the bottom line, whereas that wasn't really the case a while back. Um, so that's changing, but that's just something to keep in mind is that it's always gonna be, you know, does it make me money? Um, and the moment, the moment it's gonna be a, a little bit more of a crunch where there's gonna be less resources for just pure research in, in these companies, I think, we're gonna see a lot of strengths of doing it in academia instead where you have the freedom. 
I'm just going to interrupt for a second because I know Keenan has to leave at 1.30 and I wanted to ask him if he had any like remaining comments um, to make or if anyone had any last questions for Keenan. And I noticed Rujan has had her hand up for a while, so I just wanted to quickly interject. That. Okay, can, can, I, can I talk or no? But let's because Keenan has to leave. Uh, okay, like sure. Now. Let's 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 have it. Yes. Let's have Keenan and then you, Rushan. If that's okay sure. with Gare, who's moderating. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think that's good, Keenan. If you have any questions, or if uh, Rosina's question is for you, then we'll take it. But yeah. It was an absolute pleasure. I think my my only closing. I've been thinking about th this last question that that you're talking about here. I've been thinking about it a lot because I've been seeing this divergence in sort of what you can do with. I mean, just in, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. If, I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but the you know OpenAI's multi hundred million dollar per year compute budget, like just for one organization, it's just a, it's just a it's just a new world, right? And then of course Google spending more. We, I know Microsoft is spending more just on their compute budgets for this stuff. And I think there's there's a, in, in, so I'm starting to see you know some of the behind the scenes stuff. I get to see like it's just some really mind blowing capabilities um, and. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, don't get me wrong. I, my hope is that academia helps leapfrog a lot of those, basically makes a lot of that stuff look brute force in hindsight, if you will. Um, but in, in, at the same time, though, you know, there's kind of this like logical real, like there's this logical, at least for me, I may lack imagination. There's like, there's a logical, uh, I don't know, floor, which is, you know, at the end of the day, if you, if we want things to, to be like perception, for example, to be sort of human level perception on the road, like it's, we can't, I, I can't assume it's going to take significantly less sort of exposure to images, if you will, than a human does to get to the point where we put the human behind the wheel of a road. Uh, and that's just a big amount. That's just a lot of compute. And I think so then the question becomes like, how is, is there a world? Is there a vision? Is there a center? Is there a funding model that actually enables uh, academia to both, uh, well, access to that kind of those kind of dollars uh, and or collaborate at those kind of scales? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I hope there is because I think it's important because I, you know, if we do, if we, the, the, the pace of innovation in, in this world is so freaking fast right now. It's like, it's if we leave this untended, you know what I mean? In 10 years from now, we may see divergence that like is really bad for society if companies sort of have a lot of this stuff locked up and, and academia hasn't leapfrogged it yet, uh, sort of. And I think that that scares me because that won't, that won't be good for our society. So anyway. On that positive note, <laughs> I will. Uh, was, uh, <laughs> I'll sign off. And it was a uh, great, great talking. Listen to everybody yeah, here. Thank you so much, Keenan. Thank, thank you. It's terrific thank having you. you here. Okay. Yeah. Shall we, uh, Rujana? Uh, Rujana, go ahead. Rujana. Okay. All right. So I have uh, two comments. One is for Anka about safety. I recently I have been reading a lot of a uh, lot of neuro. <clears throat> neuroscience literature. And I would define safety as something that the system should avoid pain. And it's not accidental that biological systems have pain sensors. So you can really detect pain and therefore avoid it. And that could be a reasonable, a reasonable definition of safety. I realize it may not be as complex as Anka wanted to see that, but nevertheless, this, this idea that we have embedded in our, in our skin, basically, pain sensors. And uh, if you look at little kids, you know, they, they know how to, to move away when it's too hot and so forth and so on. So that's one suggestion I have. The other suggestion I was thinking when I was listening to Peter Abil, it's I, I'm I'm quite impressed that he has the chutzpah as the as the Yiddish word is to go into industry to to really to the industrial realm because it's obviously and he knows it it's very different from the academic research. So uh, let me tell you, when I was very young, I was involved in the barcode uh, development. 
And of course, the barcode reader is a, is a much, much simpler system than <clears throat> any of the stuff that you guys or we are collectively thinking about. But one lesson I learned that for the, in order to get the accuracy, uh, 10 to minus six. So think about it. I mean, when the, your CNN people come out and say, look, Ma, this is such a wonderful result. I have 70 or 80% accuracy. You know, I don't get too impressed when I think about those days, 10 to minus. As I said, I, I realize it's very simple, but because of the simplicity, the people who had to deliver this 10 to minus six accuracy, they had to analyze the optics. They had to analyze the ink. They had to analyze the paper on which the barcode is. So every little component had to be calibrated so that then together this system uh, gives you this performance 10 to minus six. Now, now, <clears throat> now perhaps in our robotic systems, we don't have to go that far, but when it comes to life, like in this autonomous driving, I'm not sure that you really eventually will not be asked to have at least 10 to minus three uh, accuracy of, um, of avoidance and recognition of especially the humans, human people on the road. So finally, um, as I was listening to, to Peter in his presentation, he talked quite a bit about optimization. And um, recently I have been exposed to a lot of talks on resilience and robustness. And it occurred to me that some of you folks might want to consider Optimization, even if you work in a convex domain, optimization typically refers to one point, one optimal point, but resilience and robustness has this broader kind of flattened peak. And so it seems to me that that kind of optimization with this robust combined robustness is called for. So that's all what I have to say. George, did you have a comment? No, no, okay. Uh, I, I agree with you, Jana. Uh, I mean, the only thing I would add regarding the barcodes is that, you know, uh, it also restricts, it restricted uh, the, uh, by design, yes. the yes. environment so that uh, people can achieve that level of confidence. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's uh, in addition to the, all the other analysis. Yes. I mean, yeah, if, you also look at autonomy, that, though, if you also look at autonomy from a perspective of uh, UAVs versus ground vehicles, I think one of the big differences I see is the complexity of the environment. And I yes. think yes. that is the key thing that al allows autonomy to really move forward in the UV at, uh, at uh, higher levels of autonomy because the environment is to some extent simpler. Of course, there's weather and things like that, but those right. are things that have been uh, managed from a robustness point of view over the years, where I think the sort of the sensorial un uncertainty in a, in a ground vehicle, whether that's the, 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 the surface or whether that's the, all the other agents, I think that is something that is really a technical challenge for me. So. Yeah, I was going to add the, the 10 to the negative six is very impressive. That's, you know, that, that's <laughs> quite a hallmark of a vision system that's reliable. Right. Um, I don't think anybody's matched that yet with anything else. But uh, I think also part of, I mean, part of for specifically Covariant, why we decided to work on robotic manipulation for logistics and manufacturing is because you, you you don't necessarily need 10 to the negative six. I mean, maybe you do need it once you include the human operator in the loop in some cases and you want that reliability, you don't need it in just full autonomy, 10 right. to the negative six before right. you have a viable system. And so a lot of it is thinking about, okay, what, what are the problems we can solve where, you know, maybe 10 to the negative three error rate is okay, makes for a commercially viable right. product and talking with the customers and 
clarifying to them, you know, that they might have to make some modifications on their side to, you know, make the whole process work. It can be simple things. Maybe you just need a scale under some of your bins and you know whether something was double picked or not, even if sometimes your vision system doesn't perfectly know it, you have a backup from the scale. Now that scale will not solve it for you because it's not gonna tell you, hey, you picked, two, uh, you, you, you know, picked it the wrong way, this way or that way, but it can easily call on an operator or just reroute that entire bin to an operator and say, hey, this one caused difficulties, somebody solved it. And so kind of setting those expectations, right? And making sure that, you know, Right. Yeah, we we, do, we don't try to count on a ten to the negative six vision system. Let's put it that way, to uh, <laughs> to make things commercially viable. It's it's. It, I don't think we'll get there anytime soon. Okay. Um. So Claire and I wanted to get to the question of be uh, benchmarks. Um. And uh. In this kind of relates to the how do we sort of you know demonstrate that we're confident or um, ability. I was hoping folks could kind of discuss a little bit about you know, what they think would be good benchmarks to sort of, uh, you know, to compare methods, uh, to prove confidence. Uh, so on Peter kind of gave some of the things that he tried earlier today. Uh, we talked about some application areas, uh, both today and yesterday. So I don't know if uh, somebody wants to start us off here. I'd like to bring up a point which may go back a little bit to the industry uh, academic uh, relationship, uh, uh, which is, and, and I'm going to more ask a question rather than provide an answer, but there is a little bit of a perception issue that I think this community has, which is, uh, well, you know, we have driverless cars out there, there are companies, right? What exactly are we providing here? Right. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm just going to ask a perhaps provocative statement, which is, you know, and perhaps more importantly, how do we demonstrate that we add value from a safety robustness point of view to uh, either such companies or new companies that don't exist in other domains? And that's fine. And, uh, you know, because uh, there is a little bit of an issue of, you know, the the visibility is like, um, you know, necess not necessarily in the conferences uh, when it comes to these things. You put a video and the car drives well once in a while. You know, it's a, there's a little bit of a, uh, there's a scientific issue, which we can discuss, but there's also a, an issue that we have to deal as a community as to how to make our case broadly known, uh, you know, uh, publicly. And I think that's something else we need to think a little bit about. Uh, you know, safety for some reason it's okay to 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 uh, to work on, and and I don't mean just safe. I like the way that Cyan brought it up because it's a really designed tools for autonomy at the end of the day, and rapid prototyping for autonomy uh, rather than just safety. But that being said, uh, when you show the outcome of any of these, uh, you know, robust whatever methods, uh, you know, out of distribution error, you know, maybe they don't look that that far different in a demonstration. Uh, so the question then goes back perhaps into the how do we measure, how do we demonstrate, how do we sort of make the case to the people that these things really matter. And I think that's a broader thing we have to all think about. Great. Yeah, so getting away from the, uh, the video that worked once uh, in a thousand tries. But is that the right way of demonstrating? the the the, the no, robustness of our approach that's what i'm asking and i think this yeah. is you know uh we 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 are happy with proving let's say a theorem about component a in architecture b um and and, and is, is that the is that the way and i do think that there is something there we are not capturing as far as um you know how do we show the relative uh, improvement of if you improve the design process by this way from that way or if you include this online monitor or you include this meta learning uh, approach to adapt quickly to uh, uh, out of distribution change i mean all those things i think we need to uh, demonstrating that value uh, i think and quantifying that i think is something we need to think about george i almost have sort of a tangential worry, which is, I think that we set up some toy tasks and then we can be very quantitative, right? We can say, well, the number of collisions and without my thing was this and with my thing is this or whatever, right? So I've done something, it is quantitative. What you said something that I thought was really 
really important, which is that the behavior that you're showing doesn't look that much different or doesn't look that impressive. Like it's really like you've achieved something. I think the the challenge that we have, and it's not just a safety community challenge, but it, more broadly, I think is that the kinds of behaviors that we achieve in academia are look very toy compared to the kinds of behaviors industry mm -hmm. needs to be producing. I definitely see that in cars, right? But I think just across the board in, in robotics and beyond. And speaking from an industry side, I will say that it's not as bad as we academics think because a lot of the times if academics take a toy task that's somewhat representative, right? It's enough to sort of like <laughs> stir the imagination <laughs> and say, oh, that's a method we should be investigating or taking seriously or looking at. So it's kind of okay that the onus isn't on us to make it, you know, to put a self-driving car on the road in San Francisco and make it go. That's okay that we can't do that, but it is on us to sort of pick behaviors that exemplify enough of that end goal that they're, that, that it's clear for someone in industry to say, I can see how this is actually applicable. And I can see how I probably have to do a ton more work to make it work for real in the system that we're building. And that's always the case, but mm -hmm. you know, it's a starting point. I've seen no, a I, lot I of times yeah. just picking up yeah. these ideas as starting points yeah. and building on them to do something real. Yeah, I like George's point and I like Anka's response to that as well. I think that um, often it's not the people, the folks in industry who are designing these systems who need to be convinced. They're the ones who are like hiring um, folks and asking for advice. And it's it's kind of everyone else, like the policymakers and you know the um, agencies, the the public. How it so choosing choosing the uh, the projects and the um, and the kind of examples that we want to demonstrate our technologies on as academics is really important also for the kind of broader, you know, being able to sort of say, this is really the state of the art right now. And, you know, this, this is what we should be focusing on. I think uh, uh, I completely agree. And, and we're not the only community that has this kind of issue. I mean, look at the security community the breaking a system gets a lot more visibility than defending, you know, providing cyber defense. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's just, that's, that's what the public visibility is. So I think, uh, I do think that that is something, uh, uh, and companies can also help a little bit perhaps by uh, incentivizing this, but, uh, but that's uh, a little bit different, but I do think that it is an issue. It's, uh, I think uh, uh, Sandeep mentioned it uh, yesterday um, that, you know, it's just that the safe behavior is to some extent the boring behavior and the cra crashes are more fun or breaking into security walls is more uh, newsworthy. So I think there's something there for us to, yeah, I agree. Everything was said. Great. So um, we uh, we scheduled an hour. We're a little bit over that. So uh, is, is there is there any any uh, other questions out there or any other topic the panel wants to somebody on the panel wants to bring up before we uh, conclude? Okay, uh, great. Well, this is uh, I want to thank all the speakers and uh, thank the panelists uh, for a uh, you know, very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I'm going to turn over to Claire to conclude the uh, conclude our workshop. Yeah, and I'm just going to say thanks as well. Um, thanks to all our speakers, both today and yesterday. It was just fantastic. Um, I I really uh, thank you for your engagement and um, and and just uh, the talks that are have been really informative and really, um, you know, um, just very sort of honest and serious. And, um, and, uh, and what was I going to say? Just, uh, I had one more thing. Um, and I forget, but, uh, <laughs> but it was great. Um, 
And uh, and I want to um, especially thank Gare, who, um, you know, as I said yesterday, Gare did the the lion's share. We we sort of had a meeting at the beginning, and then Gare took it away, and and really it was well, great working with you, Gare. On this. I, I, it's been great working with Claire, and she's way overstating and giving me way too much credit. So, uh, you know, the we we uh, so anyway, thanks everyone. Um, there's some additional logistics that the C3.ai staff will follow up with uh, the speakers on, and um, you know, let's. Uh, I just checked SpaceX, they haven't launched yet, but. Uh. Yeah, yeah, that's gonna hopefully happen today. Um, we'll see. Okay. Thank Good. you all, thank you, Claire. Thank you all, bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you very all much. Right. Bye everyone. Great Thanks. to see you all. Bye -bye. Thank you everyone, especially Claire and Gare for hosting. Thanks, bye. Okay, bye, Peter. <laughs>